Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Denise Ho, who is Assistant Professor of History at Yale University. She is an historian of modern China with a particular focus on the social and cultural history of the Mao period between 1949 and 1976. She is currently one of 21 fellows in the Public Intellectuals Program of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Today, we'll talk with Professor Ho about her new book, Curating Revolution, Politics on Display in Mao's China. Welcome, Professor Ho. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Marilyn. Let's start with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Sure. So my book is entitled Curating Revolution, Politics on Display in Mao's China. And what I try to do with the book is to explore the relationship between politics and exhibitions and museum culture in the Mao years. So how is it that exhibitions might inspire people to take part in political campaigns? And the book itself is structured around six case studies. And they all come from the city of Shanghai, but I think they represent a larger museum culture in China mm -hmm. um, in, in a much broader context. So let me give you some examples of the uh, case studies that sure. I, I have. I start and end with two famous or well-known studies, uh, places that are still, uh, still available. You could still visit them in China today. Mm -hmm. The book starts with um, a chapter on the First Party Congress site. So this is a revolutionary history museum. It's the place where the Communist Party was founded in 1921. Mm -hmm. So that starts the book. Um, the book ends with the history of the Shanghai Museum, which was founded in 1952 and is, I think, today probably the most um, uh, well-known, most prestigious art museum in China. And so if you've ever been a tourist to Shanghai, you will probably have gone to the Shanghai Museum. You may or may not have gone to the First Party Congress site. So mm -hmm. those are the famous case studies. And then in between, I have a number of uh, exhibitions that really only exist in people's memories or in archival materials. Okay. Um, so one of them is a history of a neighborhood to show how um, the state made housing for workers, a so-called Workers' New Village. Um, I have an exhibition uh, on for children in the 1960s explaining to them what was superstition um, and what was science, juxtaposing those two mm -hmm. um, behaviors um, or ways of thinking. And then I have two chapters. One of them is about uh, class education um, in the years leading up to the Cultural Revolution, and one is on Red Guard exhibitions. And so between those examples, I have things that are very well known and things that would, um, would disappear if we didn't uh, have a chance to think about them. Um, and so with those examples, I really want to bring people behind the scenes at the museum, mm -hmm. not just what was it like to visit these places, but how are they put together and how do they reflect the politics of that period. Okay, and what led you to be interested in this? Um, that's a good question. I think I um, was first really interested in historic preservation, so the preservation of the built environment of monuments. Mm -hmm. And that actually goes back to my time as a Yale undergraduate. Wow. So almost 20 years ago, I was a sophomore and I took my first Chinese history class. And Jonathan Spence had a lecture about uh, Liang Sicheng, who was, um, he was the fir China's first architectural historian. He studied at the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the early 20th century, he and his wife, who was um, an art historian, they went around China trying to catalog and preserve ancient buildings um, in the middle of wartime. Wow. Um, so that was a really inspiring story for me, and I was interested in historic preservation. Then I got to the archive, and I discovered that there's actually a lot of material about not just buildings, um, temples, uh, historic um, monuments, but about art and artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, I think it's useful here to think about the Chinese word for cultural relic. So the word is wan wu, so mm -hmm. culture plus object, cultural relic. And so that includes both kinds, buildings plus objects. Right. And that really brought me into uh, the study of uh, cultural preservation that way. Mm -hmm. And I ended up writing a dissertation um, about antiquity's role in revolution. Okay, and how did you do the research? It must have been um, fascinating for you to kind of go behind the scenes and take a look at these artifacts. And you also did mm -hmm. interviews with people yes. as well too. So tell us about the research. 
So I think um, the research proceeded in stages, and I like to talk about this because I think for graduate students, they think it all has to be complete, like a whole book mm -hmm. to start out with. Um, so I started out using archives, um, mostly the Shanghai Municipal Archive, uh, but some district archives as well. And I um, used the archival materials to really give background and context mm -hmm. um, to create the, the history of the bureaucracy that took care of culture. Uh, during the 20th century, mm -hmm. and how did they define what was a cultural relic and what wasn't? Okay. Um, then, uh, in my first job, I started to think of myself more as a cultural historian, and a cultural historian will look at uh, texts like a movie, um, a book. Um, uh, these the that cultural product becomes a text to read, mm -hmm. and so in this way, I think I started to think about the exhibitions as texts. Um, and then finally, as you said, I got to do a lot of interviews and do oral history, and that really helped um, me make the project come alive, mm -hmm. um, to talk to people who are curators, who visited museums, um, and really put um, some sense of what it was like to receive uh, and um, understand these exhibitions, mm -hmm. not just what was a curator's intent. Okay. When you were talking to some of these people, were there any surprises or things you didn't expect? that came out of those interviews? Um, I think uh, I, I could come up with a couple of examples mm -hmm. of what was surprising or what I didn't expect. Um, for some people, I didn't expect how much um, the Cultural Revolution, so 66 to 76, this big tumultuous political event, um, I didn't expect how much it was taboo for some people. Um, and how I, was it taboo? Um, for example, um, talking, asking about what happened, for example, someone might say something like, oh, um, it's not really clear, um, we don't have any records about this, mm -hmm. when you know, having been in the archive, I knew actually there are records. Uh -huh. um, so that is one example. So still to this day, people did not want to speak about that time? I think it really depends on what their role was and how they feel about it. Mm -hmm. um, to give you a different kind of example, um, I interviewed uh, someone who was a curator of paintings in the Shanghai Museum. And one thing that surprised me about interviewing her was um, how proud she was of the work she did um, and the sense of responsibility that she had to history. Um, so I have a chapter about how people in the museum preserved objects from destruction. And I think um, I uh, asked her about things like, um, how did you feel about revolution? Um, and uh, the answers that I got actually spoke more to her role as a professional, mm -hmm. as somebody whose job as a museum worker was to preserve these objects for, uh, for posterity. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that was really interesting that came out of interviews. Okay, and curating re revolution, to curate revolution, mm -hmm. um, help us understand what that actually means. Um, so the, that's the book's title, mm -hmm. Curating Revolution. Right. And so what I try to do in my conclusion is to think beyond what we, how we usually think about curating. Mm -hmm. So we usually think about curating as just selecting some things and putting them up. Um, when I was working in the archive, I found some interesting documents around how to make a factory exhibition in the mm -hmm. 1960s. And the memo or the directive was, um, it's not enough just to put things on display. Mm -hmm. There's a whole second half, and that's making sure people understand it. Um, there's an educative aspect of it, and that they understand it in the right way. Okay. So when I think about what it means to curate revolution, I talk about it in terms of collecting, um, in terms of narration, and then finally in terms of ritual. Mm -hmm. So collecting is putting together a collection you don't have um, you can't make a display unless you actually have things to put on display. Right. So what is it to not just collect um, things that have to do with the revolution or things that have to do with our history, but also at the grassroots, things that came from people's ordinary lives. How do you make a village exhibition? How do you make a school exhibition? Mm -hmm. So collection is just the first step. Um, narration is also a little more complicated. We think about narration as um, the things that are on the walls, the text of the museum, um, we think about the things that the docent might have said, and we actually have texts, what they said, how they were supposed to ask questions or mm -hmm. answer questions. Um, 
but there, uh, there are a couple of other elements that don't show up um, in other studies of museums. One of them is actually going down and interviewing um, people who experienced a historical event mm -hmm. and then using those, um, kind of channeling them or using them as part of the docent script. Um, and then one other piece that came out that was really exciting was to have um, handwritten notes in the archive from the docents saying, how was it, how did they perform uh, when they were in the uh, exhibition space? So mm -hmm. narratives become really important. Okay. Um, and then finally, I think the uh, exhibitions in my study really function as a ritual space. Mm -hmm. When we think about if we were in New Haven and we went to the British Art Museum or the University Art Gallery, we think of an individual going by themselves because they're interested. Mm -hmm. But in the Mao period, it was really organized. You would go with your work unit. It was very formal. Um, and uh, you might be asked to uh, recite slogans at the beginning or the end mm -hmm. of the exhibit. You might, be, uh, you might hear stories during the exhibition, or you might be called upon to tell your own story. Right. And then afterward, um, you would have a meeting in which you would talk about the proper way to understand um, the exhibit. So exhibitions in the Maoist period really become much more of a ritual space mm -hmm. in a way that I think is a little bit foreign to an American cultural context. Definitely. In fact, um, you use the word ritual. I would use the word almost indoctrination mm -hmm. in support of Mao and what was going on right. politically during that time, correct? So I'm curious, most of the exhibits, were they uh, supportive of Mao and what was going on there? Was there anything else that kind of spoke against Mao and what was going on that did not support the politics of the day then? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, this is a very politicized moment, and mm -hmm. I think um, when you said indoctrination, the word that I was thinking of is propaganda. Yes, so these yes. are, you know, absolutely um, propaganda um, or, or techniques of propaganda. Mm -hmm. Um, something that I call in my book participatory propaganda. Um, so it's not just reading a newspaper or looking at a book. Um, these are interactive spaces and contexts. Um, so was there anything ever against Mao? Um, I didn't encounter anything okay. against Mao in my research, mm -hmm. but I think what's interesting is um, you see the behind the scenes debates, like how do we present Mao? Mm -hmm. In the early 1920s when the Communist Party was founded, Mao was not that important yet. Um, but the politics of the 1960s said that you should present Mao as if he were a central figure. So there's a lot of tension behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there were probably some people who disagreed with the exhibitions, and you don't always um, get to see those materials. But I did find a report um, having to do with the class education exhibition, um, and it showed up in um, reports on counter-revolutionary comments. Mm -hmm. So you know how at the end of an exhibition, there's often a book where you can leave comments. Right. And somebody had um, written a comment saying, your exhibition is very nice, but it doesn't, it doesn't manage to cover up um, some of the sufferings that the people have faced in the past few years. And in that case, he was talking about famine. And then he wrote about his grandfather starving to death in the famine. And so those kinds of um, little critiques, mm -hmm. you can imagine that some people um, had when they went through the exhibition. But for the most part, those kinds of counter narratives aren't recorded. Right, and I can imagine the reason for that would, oh, they were probably, even if they had been, would they have been removed, I would imagine, just to be supportive Absolutely. of what was going on um, during the politics of the day there. So yes, that is fascinating. So ultimately, what would you like the reader to take away from your book? I have a couple of conclusions at the end sure. where I think about um, how the Mao period is different. Um, so one thing people might ask is, how is this different from before 1949? Um, and how is this different from today's China? Or how is it different from other um, socialist countries? How is it different from the Soviet Union? And so in my book, in my conclusion, I talk about two modes of exhibitionary culture. Mm -hmm. One of them is the mode of the state and power and the other is the mode of the state and revolution. So the state and power um, part is um, about um, exhibitions that function as tools of political legitimacy. The Revolutionary History Museum, the Art Museum, the Museum about modernization of um, architecture or housing. Mm 
Um, and I think that kind of exhibition existed before 49, mm -hmm. um, and it exists in all kinds of contexts. Um, the exhibitions of the state in power, I think, are really an innovation or something new um, that comes up during the Mao period. Um, and they actually date from before 1949. Mm -hmm. And um, it, exhibitions of uh, state and revolution really teach people how to participate in revolution. Um, so to give an example, um, this phenomenon of new exhibitions, I date back to the land reform period um, when the uh, Communist Party was still a guerrilla movement. It had these base areas and they would have these very simple um, exhibitions in the countryside where um, they would just have a table out and they would put objects on it to show, okay, they're peasants and landlords, here's a gun, um, this shows that the landlord has power. Mm -hmm. Or um, they might even inv invite, and this is very performative, the landlord to put on his finest clothes and put him on display as an example of his wealth. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the ways in which uh, categories of class become legible for ordinary Chinese people. What's a landlord? What is a peasant? What is a, a counter-revolutionary? And so one of the biggest watersheds in uh, 20th century Chinese history is the Cultural Revolution, where you had people attacked because of their class mm -hmm. uh, background and made to undergo class struggle. And so one of the things I try to do in my book is to show how exhibitions before the Cultural Revolution used personal possessions to label people as being of a bad class background. This person is a former capitalist. This person still has capitalist desires. Mm -hmm. um, and so then um, people used those material possessions to label people as having a bad class. And these have enormous consequences. So I think that's an example of showing how um, these exhibits really taught people not just about a political campaign, but how to take part in it themselves. And I think this is something that we see um, as uh, a product of the Mao period that is not often evident in China to, uh, anymore. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that is? Um, that's a good question. I, so if we think about the Chinese state today, it's a, a very confident, um, powerful, um, state that is drawing on both a revolutionary tradition and a national tradition. I think that um, the vast majority of exhibitions in China today are the exhibits of a state in power. Mm -hmm. If you go to Beijing, you can go to the National Museum of China. These are about, these are exhibits about political legitimacy. The times when you have the exhibits of the state and revolution, um, you have, uh, it's when the state goes into a campaign mode. So for example, I think the most classic one might be um, campaigns against corrupt officials. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, the techniques that they borrow, um, here are the, um, um, here's all of the money that this person <laughs> embezzled or whatever, right. um, and here's their corrupt lifestyle. Those are a throwback to the Mao era. Um, so when the state goes into political campaign mode, I, th I think you have um, the revival of that kind of exhibitionary mm -hmm. culture. But I think for the most part, and here's the main difference, um, the uh, state, uh, when um, those political campaigns are looking for enemies, um, a corrupt official, for example. Mm -hmm. These are not enemies of the revolution, they're enemies of the state. Um, so I think that shows um, how, uh, how very different the Chinese state is today, even when it draws upon that revolutionary repertoire. Okay, fascinating. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing some of your work. Thank you for having me. For more information about Professor Ho and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.